Hello and welcome back to Unpopular People. We believe that listening and learning from each other is key for personal development and success. Today in our interview, Len Tenorio, like 10 Oreos, that's what he just told me. Hi Len, how are Hello. you today? I'm, I'm doing good. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to have you um, on our podcast and like, to have an interview with you today because we're working together for a while now and I, I just hear like so many interesting stories from your life um, and I think you fit perfect into our format here. So um, I'm very excited about this interview and um, so to get started, the first question we usually ask our guests is where were you born and how did you grow up? Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your childhood. Oh, gee, I've been a, a gypsy since birth. And, and, you know, saying that to Europeans, they, they cringe at that idea that I call myself a gypsy, but I just mean someone who roamed and lived all over because uh, I grew up, my father was in the U.S. military, so the first uh, 20 years of life were moving um, from place to place. I went to 12 schools before I graduated from high school. Some people love that, some people hate that. To me, it just developed a personality that you have to be a little bit out there to um, connect with everybody. So um, t to me, the moving didn't bother me. And I continued that through my adult life. So I just have lived five or six foreign countries. I've lived all over the United States lived several places in New Zealand now, so uh, that's why I use the title that I call myself a gypsy. <laughs> yeah, okay, and um, I find it um, fascinating to go to 12 different schools, so um, you must have experienced different school systems in different countries, like um, which ones stick to you or stuck to you the most of all those schools that you've been to? Oh, as a, as a little kid going to school, ele elementary school, well, pre-elementary, probably kindergarten type ages. We lived in France at the time. And um, I uh, had to learn French, but I, I learned French as a little kid does in the street. So my French running a conversation as an adult is like a five-year-old would talk. So my French isn't very good. I understand a lot of what everyone says. But I think the French um, school was little different that was sticks to my mind even as a five-year-old because of the discipline they have um, forcing me to write with my right hand when I write with my left hand or everything was regimented everything was we were like little soldiers and you, everybody dresses the same which is very different than an American style so as a little kid um, that was way too regimented for me and I just threw a fit that I wasn't going to school anymore so I am a kindergarten dropout. I, I did drop out and my mother said it was more trouble to fight with me, so I just didn't go to school till I was six and a half. So that was a, probably something memorable about early education. Short of that, I think, I think some places were as short as six months living going to school. And um, yeah, so not much happens in, in six months moving somewhere. The only time in my whole school career up to high school that I was uh, devastated by the move was puberty. <laughs> <laughs> I was 12 or 13, and then you're, you're attracted to each other. People are out there and have their attractions. So it's the first time I, I, I had a girlfriend, and it was I was devastated to leave. Um, no other reason, just because she was there. I mean, it wasn't a wonderful place. It was Amarillo, Texas. So, uh, yeah, that was the only time that it was traumatic moving. Short of that, I always viewed it as an experience. I think it, it forms your character later in life. I, even to this day, find it very difficult to meet people and become good friends with them because I'm moving on. I'm why well, get real close to people because I'm going to move on again. 
And did you say you were an only child, or do you have? Any oh siblings? no, no, no! I'm I'm from a family of six children, wow. <laughs> six kids, and uh, what I, what I said earlier about moving around. Some people love it, some people hate it. Some of my brothers just dreaded it, hated it, and didn't do well in school because of it. To me, it didn't make any difference. It was you just a different place. You just keep on moving. Mm -hmm. So kindergarten dropout in France, um, then Texas. I heard. Uh, c can you name a few other places of the schools oh, that you've been to? <laughs> we um, I, after France, we moved to. Idaho. We moved to a military base that was a strategic air command. Now, if people who don't know what that is, that is a the nuclear bases for the U.S. military. This is where they store the nuclear weapons at strategic air command bases. So most kids go through school with um, fire drills. We went through school with nuclear drills. I mean, and it was regular. We had. Air I know what to do if we had a nuclear attack. Well, that was in, you know, in the 60s and 70s, that kind of stuff. But still, the idea that little kids have to be taught nuclear drills is just, um, un well, what outrageous. would Outrageous. <laughs> yes, outrageous that that, that that happened. And it's just because we lived on a military base that had nuclear bombs. Um, after... Our, Idaho, we moved to Texas. We moved all over Texas, uh, several different military bases, Amarillo, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, San Angelo, Texas. Um, and then my father retired. So they moved to Colorado, and people will say to me, where are you from? And people think I'm from Colorado because that's where my family retired. I lived there for three years before I started my journeys as an adult, mm -hmm. moving on after high school. So um, Colorado, and then I, when it was time to go to university, I had to chose, choose somewhere furthest away from the family as I could, as any 18-year-old would want. I got to get away from them. Mm -hmm. So uh, not that life was bad with, with the family, it's just, just what you do, you have to get away from them. So I'm, I'm a child of the 60s, and in the 60s, everybody was moving to California. If you lived in the U.S., everybody was going to California. Oh, With when I graduated. Flowers in their hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's exactly the period of time. Yes, when the, the, the summer of love. But every kid was graduating from high school, moving to California. Most people loved Los Angeles or San Francisco. I didn't do that. I made sure if everybody else was doing it, I certainly wasn't going to do it. Um, I moved to Idaho to a university, and then every summer I would find another place to go to work. Uh, one summer was in Kansas. Another t summer I went back to Texas to work. Another summer I stayed in Idaho to work. This was, you know, during my university through my university years. Mm -hmm. So I found a different place to go just because uh, I had to keep on moving. And then, as soon as university finished, I wanted to move to Seattle, Washington. I was fascinated by Boeing aircraft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't know what it was about Boeing, but I thought that would be the place to work. I mean, I really didn't know much about the work world at that time. So Boeing seemed like the place to go. Was it the military part of Boeing? Because I think they have like different branches, right? There's not only like the air airplanes, uh, like the um, uh, commercial airplanes, but also like the military part that they have. Well, no, I, it probably wasn't that because the military – aircraft it, what wasn't what appealed to me what appealed to me was the great big giant jets i mean it was we were the jet age we were barely coming into the jet age um the 747 was being developed and i had read about that um so i you know some kids want to be a fire engine or, or a fireman i wanted that to be a 747 i always thought that would have been the coolest thing to be <laughs> was the plane <laughs> i was just fascinated by aircraft when i was younger nowadays i don't care much about it but as, as a even as a teenager aircraft was a very uh, fascinating subject to me mm -hmm. 
And um, just to come back to your parents, um, so you said your dad was working for the army, um, uh, for the military. Um, and um, yeah, what what was his job and when he moved around so much? Um, did you ever have to go to like any because in, in the sixties and oh he re when, which which year did he retire? Your dad? 67 he retired. Oh, okay, so 67. So like he d you didn't have to go to Vietnam or like any of those. Times no, they or? never took take their families to to Vietnam or or to any mil uh, hostile zone. Um, During my lifetime, my father served in Japan when I was very, very young, and we didn't go because it was a, a, a one-year assignment, so we stayed. And then his years in France was the only place that the whole family moved with him okay. on his job. Short of that, it was, it was in the United States, all the moving. Um, funny story about military. When I graduated from high school... I decided I wanted to join the Navy. So I was 17 years old and went and enlisted. I mean, it was during the draft age, and the Navy was exotic. The Army was very um, mundane. It was the normal, ordinary thing. So I couldn't do the normal, ordinary thing. Mm -hmm. So the Air Force was, you know, a little bit higher status, but I wanted to go into the Navy. So I went and enlisted. And I got accepted, and now I had to go to the regional uh, induction center and go do a swearing-in ceremony. You have to be sworn in allegiance to the U.S. So I had asked my recruiter, at what point can I back out of this? He says, you can back out of it until you swear in. Then we own you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so I get to the induction ceremony where we had to swear in that day. Um, I'd ridden for three hours on a bus because it was in the major city of Denver and we lived in a little tiny mountain town. And all of a sudden that was going through my mind. They'll own me. They'll own me. So I refused to swear in. Good, good job. <laughs> <laughs> so I got back home that night and um, my father you know, asked me how it went and I says, well, I refuse to swear in so I, I don't go. I am not going. And he said, he was so happy. He says, I am so happy for you. And I says, why? I was a little insulted because he was overjoyed. He says, because you would have spent the rest of the war in jail. You were the most undisciplined child I've ever had. <laughs> so I, I always remember that, that he said, you're the most undisciplined child I've ever had. <laughs> It's funny, huh? And um, and how how was it? Um, your siblings, um, you, you have six siblings, right? That's yeah. yes. And um, are they all older, or younger than you, or are you two older and three younger? Mm -hmm. And are they so they all move together, of course, with you, or like some of them stay? They, they all the live in the same town where my father retired. Most of them were t were tired of the move and never moved again. I mean, I have a brother who's. Um, Married his girlfriend from when he was 14, and they, and this is what, close to 55 years later, they're still married, living in the same little town, mm -hmm. never left. So, yeah, most, most of the family just stayed right in the same place. And what do you think um, is inside of you that um, that you have this travel bug, <laughs> let's call it like this, and um, like your siblings, they don't have this? Well, I don't know. I, I think I just always had this, uh, I was curious about other cultures, other places. Uh, when I go traveling now, I don't go to the big major cities to go see the big major events. I want to go to the poor countries, to go to the villages, to the mountain, l little places where uh, people are learning to give, get by, not, not the big prosperous cities. I mean, I've been to the most touristed city in the world is Paris, but I've also been to the poorest villages in, um, I was going to say Belize, but it's not Belize, <laughs> Bolivia, <laughs> Bolivia. I spent about half a year living in Bolivia way back in the 80s, and it, it, it was, I enjoyed it very much because of learning the culture. I mean, how many people have been to the Brujas Marcando, which means the, the witch's market, and that's 
an event in the city. Everybody goes to the witch's market. It's like the witch doctor. You go buy herbs and things at a witch's market. So, you know. Did they have to, um, like when I was in Bolivia, um, they had like, the res wrestling going on. Was it in the 80s? Was it already a thing, like wrestling? Um, I don't recall wrestling. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was just curious because I saw that and I was quite confused with uh, like the women were tra wearing their traditional Bolivian clothes and those like the, the small hats. Um, and um, yeah, and, and they were fighting against um, like very small people. Um, and <laughs> it was a bit confusing. So I was just wondering if you experienced something like that. No, no. One, one of the things I remember about trekking through uh, south america i was staying at a i've had some interesting stories i was staying at a salvation army orphanage i was living in an apartment on top of this old old building um well more to the story i was engaged to one of the missionaries that worked there so uh, i've had a very colorful life but um that's what i was doing in south america for that year but um we decided to go on a trip through the uh basically the outbacks of Argentina. And I remember the travel books don't even talk about it, but if you want to survive when you're way out there away from civilization, you knock on doors for something to eat. I mean, you pay them for it, but that was the whole culture of these far, far remote places is you go knock on doors and ask people, are they serving any anything tonight? Mm -hmm. They usually had a set price for it, but that's That's how it was. Also, for sleeping, you do the same thing. You don't have hotels or hostels or anything out there, so you just go knock on a door somewhere. Mm -hmm. So um, a shy person couldn't survive like that. You you have to, uh, and I'm not shy, so you just go knock on a door <laughs> and uh, keep on moving. So that was a fun year living living in that environment. And did you travel on your own, or uh, were you with with someone throughout? No, the time? I had I had a a girlfriend with me for a good part of it and then the other half of it because we broke up in the middle of this <laughs> who doesn't break up on these kind of trips <laughs> and um so bolivia i spent most of the time myself and it was just exploring around um because i could live for 25 dollars a week i mean mm -hmm. who wouldn't stay yeah it's way better than going back to work in the states so it was good Yeah, okay. And so you said you went to university um, in the States? Or, yes. And um, can you le let us know what you studied um, and also what was the, were the reasons for you to study what you studied? Well, okay, I arrived my first you know, orientation and they said, what are you going to major in? You've got to start with something. You can't just, I mean, I just thought, I don't know, just general studies. So they kept pushing the idea, you've got to start with something. So I says, okay, give me your catalog, and I thumbed through it. And where my finger stopped, I says, okay, those classes I'll start taking. Well, it was business law. So I started in taking business subjects. And um, at the end of the first year, they asked me, what are you going to, you know, they, they, the counselor had set my agenda for me. In business and I thought well I didn't choose that I said well look you've already taken five courses you're, you're you're too far along now to back out of this so I just stuck with the uh, business administration and accounting and just finished with it mm -hmm. um, back in the 70s mid 70s when I graduated it was one of those up-and-coming careers where you'll always have a job in it because of the way I did things I'm not you know, the uh, certified public accountant. I just kept moving on, moving on. Mm -hmm. The good thing about it is you can get a job anywhere in the world as an accountant. It's the same accounting standard worldwide. Um, once you get past the language barrier, wherever you're going, the skill is the same. And so I've never, ever had a problem finding a job anywhere I went because you've got um, accounting skills. Mm -hmm. What what was the initial spark um, to pick a certain place? Like um, I don't know, like w after you graduated and you you wanted to go to Boeing, <laughs> like what what happened? Like which company did you work for first, and um, and what country did you choose to live in afterwards? Like what sparked the interest for a for a certain country? 
getting a job. <laughs> one of the um, the one of the first major jobs after university was um, in the late seventies, mid seventies. The oil industry was booming, and America was doing their oil shale projects, and um, the whole Western United States. You could find pipeline jobs. You could find um, oil. Uh, prospectors everywhere. It was just a big, big industry. So I decided that was the industry to go to. Um, it was very short-lived. I only survived for probably a year and a half in the oil industry. It was just too Republican, <laughs> too white, too middle class. <laughs> that's a little racist to say that, but that's what the industry was to me. Um, they they weren't into... Um, um, I'm a Native American, so I was a minority. So to them, I was not one of their chosen people. So it, I didn't last long because of that. So then I went to work for an airline. My love for Boeing, I went to work for an airline. And um, this airline, it, in, in the same period of time, this was by now we were reaching 1980, um, People were dying to get into the airlines. You got travel benefits. It was no matter what job it was. Well, I was an accountant for an airline in Denver, Colorado. And I had been there about mm, two or three months. And someone came to me and handed a paper and says, oh, you need to choose your holidays for next year. And I says, oh, well, well, I won't have very many holidays. I haven't been here long. But I guess I'll just attach them to, you know, Fourth of July or Labor Day or Christmas or, and the lady laughed at me and she says, "You'll be lucky to get a Wednesday in the middle of the winter." And I says, "Why?" She says, "Well, in the union, you're the bottom of the bottom of the barrel. You're you're just started here. You're not going to get anything." And I was shocked that I was a union because I'm a very anti-unionist. <laughs> I just didn't know that everyone even. As an accountant, you're part of the clerical union that the airline had. You know, just trying. And they forced me into that. So I walked up and turned my resignation in. Just, <laughs> just to me. In those days, I, I, you know, the money didn't matter. It's just uh, me being happy was more important. I guess my whole life has been that way. Me being happy is all that matters about a job. So I quit, and and the manager comes to me immediately. He says, "You can't do that. We waited a month for you. Gave you for a notice." And I says, "Sorry, I don't do unions." And and so I walked off the job. Well, my relatives and friends of mine all were just thinking how horrible of me. Everybody wants to work for the airlines. I didn't. I'm not going to work for a union. So, to that, I you know, here's all these years later, I've survived without ever having a union behind me. Okay. <laughs> So I worked in a variety of jobs through that period of time. Um, I worked for waste management in the early years when um, I considered them to be a mafia company. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> oh, the things that the, you know that these companies would do way back in their early days to uh, get um, keep their customers, do whatever. It, it was just, yeah, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. A lot of it is a little too... Uh, out there, but yeah, I didn't last long in waste management. But then all of a sudden, one day, I had quit my job and I was moving to the other end of the country. I was going from Colorado to Boston, Massachusetts, and the only connection to Boston was I was following a love life, <laughs> following someone to Boston. But that wasn't to be. While I was traveling cross-country, I stopped to call my mother, and she said, oh, you got a phone call from a company in the U.S. Virgin Islands. They're looking for an accountant, and someone uh, had heard you did the same software that they do. Well, I changed my direction. Well, I went back to Colorado, dropped off my stuff, and flew to the Virgin Islands, and uh, continued on with an adventure. So I lived in St. Croix for a while. And uh, that was, I worked for a resort wear company. So I started in the fashion business from trash business to oil business to fashion business. It, it, I was all over the board, but I, I enjoyed the time down there. So during my time 
in the Caribbean, I lived in two two different locations. Lived in in uh, Saint Martin in the Netherlands Antilles, and in Saint Croix for part of the time. And uh, when I had nothing better to do every weekend, I would uh, go to San Juan, Puerto Rico. It was only a half hour flight, and you know, when you're that young, you uh, you don't matter if you, it doesn't matter if you spend every penny you have. You're going to have a good time. Yeah. So uh, that was those years. And um, that went on for about four years, five years, doing that kind of stuff back and forth. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, then I moved on to Boston. I, I decided I would go to Boston at that time um, just because I was looking at the history of it. I liked old, old cities, and Boston is probably one of the oldest in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I have to say – in my adult life, it was the best experience. Mm-hmm. Um, first time I was free to date, go out, do what I wanted to do, be single, and it was the height of um, oh, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It, it, it just was my time. Mm-hmm. It was my time to shine, and I had a very good time. What age? What age were you then? I was probably thirty-two. Mm-hmm. 30, 32 about then. The only thing wrong with that um, period of time was the HIV epidemic was at the height. It was it was uh, everywhere. This was like 83, 84, 85. And so, um, you know, everywhere you go, it was uh, no huggy, kissy, no touchy, no um, everyone, any bar you go to, it was obvious what was going on with people. I mean, I think what people do to go pick up and find people in bars still went on, but it was very different. It was no, it was no longer the party wasn't going on. It was, uh, yeah, everyone was. You ask a lot of questions, and uh, yeah, it was it was very different. So after I left Boston, I went from a uh, fringe city with the HIV ap- epidemic and I moved to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. So I jumped into the frying pan. And um, that was in- interesting. I lived there during it became a political fight mm-hmm. the HIV issue because the US government spent no money on uh, research mm-hmm. or development or prevention. There was nothing said by the government. The word HIV or AIDS was never uttered by a president. Mm-hmm. And to this day, I still blame the Reagan administration and later the Bush administration for letting the pandemic get out of control. I mean, people say the rest of the world had obligations too, but America was a leader and they did nothing during the AIDS epidemic to until years later when it became a popular issue for politicians to, uh, to, to move on to that. Yeah. Uh, wow. <laughs> I mean, there's so much, so much here um, to unwrap. Um, but I'm, I'm. The one question I have about all your traveling is: um, so, do you own a lot of things? Um, because it, by the sound of it, when you're like moving so much, I, I don't think so. <laughs> well, that's a very good question. Um, in the early years, I, I, I would be like anyone else, and you had your things. And then I've had to abandon my things several times through the years. And so I'm not a consumer. I, I don't buy household decorations and, you know, pictures of family here and there. I mean, after you've abandoned everything, not abandoned. I, I like, like one time I, I had a household of products and I was moving to Indonesia um, I had two week period of time from the employer. I lived in uh, San Francisco, and they said, "Oh, we need you to move to Jogjakarta, Indonesia." Okay. <laughs> in the all mid- right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, all right, let's go. What, 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 you know, what's holding me back? Well, I put all this stuff in storage. Well, then, after about five years of in, of storage. I transferred it to a friend's garage. Their garage supposedly got broke into, everything was stolen, blah, blah, blah. It was all gone. So that was the first time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and another time, the same thing happened. I, I let somebody 
hey, can you put this in your garage? Well, pretty soon there was nothing left. Who knows what happened? So I don't, I don't keep anything. There's no mementos. There's no souvenirs of past life. I don't even have a, a book of pictures anymore. If it doesn't exist on a computer from the mid nineties on, it doesn't exist in my life. And, and that's fine. I, I, I see people out there spending huge money on their exercise equipment for their house or beautiful furniture or their expensive car. None of that is all appealing. Um, I'd rather use the money going somewhere. Well, now I save it for retirement, (laughs) so I'll survive in those days. That's another drawback of this. You never build a financial backing because you keep on moving and you keep on moving and you keep on moving. But, uh, yeah, that's... That's very cool. Um, I, I'm I'm quite impressed, and um, I, I have to say, like um, I live a very similar lifestyle. <laughs> like uh, I really enjoyed my time um, traveling through the world, um, just having my backpack and nothing else. Um, and um, yeah, and I still like I find it hard to get more things. Like the more the more I have, the more I feel like um, it's an you know like an obligation, <laughs> like it's something that I have to keep safe and and look after all the time. So I rather have less things and um, be free and uh, you know like I can pack my things and just leave tomorrow and I really enjoy this feeling and uh, by the sound of it you 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 are feel the same well yes that 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 sort of um, brings up a subject of uh, buying things and if you spent a lot on it you think you have to protect it and keep it and that's a burden it's a burden because I have this – well, I can't just walk off and leave this. That was $5,000. And it's like, yeah, nowadays I, I, I'm not attached to anything. Um, yeah, that makes life sometimes easier. Yeah. yeah. Another time I was living in a <laughs> – here we go with some of my funny stories. I was living in a lesbian artist community in the mountains in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> so I was I was looking to move. I was living in a little town in Colorado, and I wanted to move out of town. I wanted to be alone. I wanted to get out there. So I found this ad for this little town in Colorado up in the mountains, and I answered the ad, and the lady on the phone said, oh, we need to set up an appointment to come uh, meet you. And I says, oh, I want to come up there to meet you. She says, no, 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 we want to come to where you live and meet you. Thought that was weird. So here her and um, her entourage of two other ladies come to visit me. And um, we get into the house and start a discussion, and pretty soon it's obvious that all three of them are lesbians. And um, they were coming to check out to see if, I fit in with living with them in this little town. It was such a close-knit little town. And um, it turned out that we all mixed together. It was fine. So I moved up and lived with all these ladies in this little mountain community. It was interesting to watch because as a gay man, I understand... Gay men don't um, nest like women, like lesbians do. I know I'm generalizing, but... In this community up there, everybody had a job. Regardless what you were, what job you had, you still had a job in the community. And it was sort of uh, unspoken, but pretty much everybody had a job up there. So and so provides computer expertise, she'll fix your computer. So and so has office supplies if you need it. So and so, she's a you know she's a medical tech, and if you need anything, she'll take care of you over there if you have an emergency. Um, they had a school bus system to get each other's kids to school in the town down below, and I was very impressed with them. One night, it was in the middle of a snowstorm, and I was driving up home. And my car went off the road, and I thought, "What am I?" This was before the days of everybody. Well, we had cell phones, but cell phone didn't work on my mountain. <laughs> That's how far we were from town. So I went off the road, and I thought, "What am I going to do?" I, I can't call anyone. It was um, probably about ten degrees below Celsius, so it was pretty cold up there. Well, within ten minutes, I had. Uh, Two women in their trucks down there getting me out, and it was, uh, they all take care of each other. 
That's really good, yeah. Like, that's how community It was just work, community. Yeah. It was uh, uh, same thing with our trash. You put your trash in a certain place and so-and-so takes it. On a, we, People had to take turns making sure the trash got down to a landfill. But it, it was just uh, – I was very impressed with the organization that these women put to having a life, you know, away from the rest of the world. And what, um, I mean, besides that they are only women, um, but what was the reason for you to leave at some point? Oh, my employer, I was working remotely. And this was in the days of the um, computer revolution. The hit games, the big A-plus shoot em up kill em up games that uh, Blizzard Entertainment, the uh, Warcraft and Starcraft and all this kind of stuff were coming into being. And uh, the people that I worked for in California, I would go to California once a month to my office, and the rest of the time I worked remotely on my mountain. And um, In those days, we had a dial-up internet. You'd I was just about to ask, like, how, how did you connect to the rest of the world? <laughs> My house had a phone, and once a day you dial up into a certain number in New Jersey, and you download your files, and then they downloaded them to wherever it went to. And so you only got your mail once a day, you know. But uh, it was the early years of, of uh, I mean, we'd had emails before that, but living remotely, this was how it happened. Uh, It sounds like heaven to me, to be honest, just getting mates once a day. <laughs> so every night you, you make sure you dial up and you send off whatever files you had. And you had answers by the time you got up in the morning. So it was, it was quite cool. It was, uh, but why did I leave that job? It was sort of heaven. You, you, you were alone. I liked being alone. The serenity of living in a little A-frame cabin in the hills in a deep snowstorm with zero sound out there. So it was, um, I might sound like a little bit of a hippie, but I, I'm really not. So you could get out on the deck and smoke a joint. <laughs> it was just heaven to do that in that kind of a dry, dry, dry atmosphere in the mountains like that. But it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. But why I left was one day my employer called and said, hey, we're starting up a uh, company in Singapore and uh, you need to go. Okay. And I I thought, well, gee, okay, you know, maybe in three or four months when my lease is up. And he says, oh, no, 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 you need to leave in like four days. <laughs> They had already started the company and things were going. So I landed up in Singapore five days later. And uh, another one of the times I packed my goods and left it sit in a, in a storage unit. And, uh, and I had just bought a new car. So I gave the car to a relative and said, oh, can you pay the payment on it and you can have this car? And well, of course that, I mean, I landed up paying the payments <laughs> until it was done. But you know, that was just, it was like one of those things you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. That's a, a possession that holds you down. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, a brand new car and I had to, uh, it was a possession that held me down. It's like, well, what am I going to do with this thing? Mm -hmm. And it was a nice car, but Here I paid for something that I kept for six months and paid on it for four years till it was paid off and it was yeah. but I gave it to a relative. It was okay. If you if you think back on all like all the things that you buy and, and give away and, and everything and um I mean it's just um like people like you and um I include myself into this as well because I got rid of all my things and I'm actually quite happy that they are a gun. Um but just thinking of like how much stuff is bought and forgotten and and, and it just like disappears, it goes like somewhere else and it's it's incredible like how much stuff stuff is moving around <laughs> everywhere well i have a theory about this subject well not particularly things but clothing and fashion you walk around and you see particularly the w nice weather here in christchurch you see all these girls in their lycra and people in their running shorts and their biking clothes and all this and all i think about is that's the worst form of pollution in the world right now That is totally the biggest amount of stuff that goes to the landfill that comes from fashion. Yeah. And um, as Maria Kondo says, if it, if it doesn't bring you joy, get rid of it. I mean, to me, all that stuff would never bring me joy. Yeah. Uh, so to me, I dress like 
bag man sometimes, <laughs> but but I don't. I, I'm not into fashion at all, and and not because I don't like fashion, but I look at it as it's it's part of one of the plights of our of our times yeah. is fashion. A hundred percent agree. Like um, Elisa, my wife, she's um, she's worked in the industry, in the fashion industry, and she got so disheartened by it that she left uh, the industry, and it's now um, working towards um, like a more sustainable, like textiles and uh, uh, sorry, sustainable fabrics and things like this. Um, yeah, it's it's really, um, and I learned so much through her, like what the impact of. Um, clothes and fashion has on on our world. It's uh, I think the construction uh, constructions are like the, f- the biggest polluter, and afterwards it's like the fashion industry. I I was going to say that. I mean, we live here in Christchurch, and there's a huge amount of new buildings going up, new housing everywhere. And I'd read that whatever that house weighs in tonnage, that's how much plastic tonnage went to build that house, either protecting the products or in the building of the products. So the pollution in a brand new house, it's why I'm not a consumer of a new house. Well, that's not the only reason. <laughs> Money's another reason. But but looking at the, all these new houses, I just look at them as being, oh, that's more part of the plight of our time. Plastic. Yeah, yeah, that's the unfortunate truth. Um, so after after you left the mountain um, in the lesbian community, um, and uh, you were called to, to go to Singapore, Singapore, yeah, that was the next step. Um, and um, yeah, so like, what happened in Singapore? What did you do there? And um, how is the connection Singapore Christchurch? Can you fill the gaps? <laughs> well, I stayed seven years in Singapore. And um, my first few years was utter hate. Um, It was just a materialistic plastic world. Um, So my first year, every every payday, I would um, hoard cash. I had like forty, fifty thousand dollars hoarded in my house, hidden away because I'm going to run away next month. As soon as payday rolls around, I'm going to cash my check and I'm take this money. I'm leaving. I hated it there. Well, I'd been there about not quite a year, and um, I fell in love. <laughs> Again. <laughs> <laughs> so this changed the whole setup, falling in love, and um, I landed up staying seven years in Singapore. Um, and I'm still with that person um, all these years later, it's 27 years now, so um, um, it must be love. <laughs> but what I did in Singapore, I worked in the in, uh, computer software industry, and we were, first of all, we started off as kids' educational software for the school system. In, the, in those days, everything was a disk. So if you had uh, 550 kids in your school, they bought 550 discs of something for, you know. So we we did quite well in, in that environment. But by the end of that, it was coming into licensing software. There was no such thing as a disc anymore. It was, uh, we just upload your server and you're paying for 50 licenses for your school and whatnot. Um, so it was pretty good for the seven years and doing the the, the kids shoot 'em up games, um, that worked pretty well. Well, all of a sudden, our company had a big hiccup with our main supplier, and our main supplier was the world's main supplier. So um, our company was going to um, have to find something else to do. Um, all the principals of our company decided they were moving to uh, Thailand. Thailand had very little restrictions in how you run a business and singapore is is uh, very very strict and um i had to make a decision i was i was tired of the busy 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 life of singapore uh singapore and new york and tokyo they're all the same run 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 the minute you get off a plane you're on high gear all the time and i was tired of that so um i was looking for a low-keyed lifestyle Mm -hmm. and the rules had to be it's american uh, english as the first language Mm -hmm. and it not the usa usa was going home that was uh too easy i I couldn't take the easy option 
Um, so there was Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the UK. Um, UK wasn't an option. It's too busy. London's just like Tokyo and Paris, and that busy, busy. So I tried Australia. And the bastards turned me down. My visa. So you applied for a visa. <laughs> I applied for a visa and they turned me down. <laughs> But what, what visa did you apply for? And why, what? A, a working visa. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just, um, in those days, it, to, to get a work visa, you had to be under 40. You have to enter the country before you reach your 46th birthday. And I was already 45 when I applied. And they said, it, they'll, I'll never get a visa within that period of time. Which year was that? About 2000, 2001. Okay. And so I took all my documents and um, went over to the New Zealand consulate in Singapore. And it took 12 days to get a full permanent residence visa permanent for the rest of my life i could have that really <laughs> <laughs> but i had all every document you could imagine because of the australians and and i had studied new zealand's law and um but was it the time that they were looking in like in particular for people like like, like you like uh, accountants and or like what was the no they had opened up the borders in the country and it was it was new and they just pretty much didn't have limits as long as you spoke english passed the english competency tests had a university degree had at least 10 years work experience behind you and a few dollars to get there um you got a visa mm -hmm. and um yeah so here i am 20 years later and um still here so um so you moved with your partner are you guys married or you, okay so you're not married um so you moved together here um from singapore um and then you arrived in auckland and what was the first thing you did like did you have a job straight away or did you just enjoy your time first up there and then move down here or what was your journey in new zealand um new zealand was a little bit hard of a start because they weren't used to immigrants um, I always thought I'd have an edge because I had a degree from an American university. Well, that didn't mean anything. You have no New Zealand experience. I don't think people go through that nowadays as much because they're bringing in people from all over. As long as you've got a skill, they'll adapt to you. But back in those days, if you didn't have New Zealand experience, nobody was willing to take a chance. So um, I volunteered i found a company some people that i'd become friends with and i says i will be your accountant for free for six months okay um after about two months they, they just said oh, we'll pay you nice. and i mean I, i i fit into what they were doing I, i i knew how to deal with what we were doing and um so that was the first job mm -hmm. and from then on it was it's never really been hard to find a job in the country once you get your first particularly in business everybody wants you to know the banking system the tax system the gst system all of this other kind of stuff and um as long as you say yeah i've got new zealand experience and, and nowadays is no different and um so then you worked up there um and then you moved down to otatai where we are now um christchurch um so what brought you down here well i came We left Auckland because the same reason It's we a big city. <laughs> the same reason we left Asia. Life had become too fast. Traffic is too bad. Um, Auckland is a city without a soul, in my opinion. They don't know how to plan. Everything they plan and do is already obsolete when it gets finished. And so their roads are horrible. Their infrastructure is horrible. Their public transit's horrible. Do you think I like Auckland? <laughs> <laughs> By the sound of it, I would probably say no. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's that's why we left there. It's just Christchurch is is a is a lifestyle city. It, it it offers a lot. There's no traffic. You're not more than 15 minutes away from anywhere. 
from um, the airport, like 15 minutes from the airport, from anywhere in the city. From pretty anywhere much. in the city, you could go. There's no traffic jams. Um, people say 8:30 in the morning we have traffic jam, but that's you, you compare that to Auckland, yeah. and it's nothing. It's yeah. nothing. And um, it, you, we used to be a reasonably priced city, but now we're getting up there with Auckland in price. But you know that you can't fault the city for that. That's just the nature of the time yeah and it's a beautiful place i mean anyone that has been here before and um like we love it here like this is this has become our home and um we would have never thought that any other place you know besides your home where you grew up um becomes your home but yeah I, we can really call this our home <laughs> well when we first came to new zealand in 2001 um we went on a trip all over the country to see where we liked and uh, Christchurch reminds me of Colorado. It has the same terrain. I mean, we're not the high altitude, but the look of, of the country is like the little town where I'm from. Very flat. I'm from the high mountain desert. We're leading right into the Rocky Mountains where I'm from in Colorado. Well, we have mountains right behind us, and it's pretty much desert right in the city of Christchurch. And um, I always thought I was going to move here. And... Um, one day, my partner just says to me, if we're going to move, this is the only time. If not, we're going to stay here and shut up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just uh, put the plans in motion that night, and within weeks, we were on our way. Mm -hmm. So here we are. And um, I think this is an easy place to find a job mm -hmm. compared to most places. I've. Uh, you're not competing with a huge amount of people, um, easy to find a job. People are relatively okay. There's very little crime here. It's uh, um, I could be a salesman for the city. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I, I I could help you with that. I could be a salesman for the city as well. Um, and I w also wanted to ask you, um, because you mentioned community before, um, and you explained that, you know, when you lived on the mountain with the lesbians, <laughs> um, that they, they had like a strong community. Um, do you sense the same here? Like, because we experience like, strong communities here in Otatai. Do you have the same experience? Oh, uh, you know, we're not probably as social as probably you are. Um, with connections, so I don't. I don't know. I don't think th this city. Well, okay. Let's put it this way: in Auckland, now being a gay man, there's lots of gay entertainment in Auckland that doesn't exist here in Christchurch, and um, I don't think it's necessary. People meet anywhere. People go anywhere. You're safe anywhere. There's no. Uh, Probably there's discrimination, but it's not over everywhere. Yeah. It, this is very, very safe, very accepting place to live. Yeah, absolutely. So where, um, may I ask you, where did you guys meet, you and your partner? Met inside a bar in Singapore that was hidden away up on top of a high, you know, about the 25th st story of a building and here was this little gay bar hidden away and the first time I went there I said to the uh, bartender I says you know this was the hardest gay bar I have ever had to find and he says good we like it that way keeps us safe and Singapore was pretty homophobic not really homophobic but they kept it under wraps they kept everything hidden back in 1995 96 uh, nowadays, they say it's just like any other cosmopolitan city. The gay culture is thriving there. But back in those days, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, so was it where you might sometimes um, worried or like um, afraid that someone will find out or something like that? No, they, what, there was nothing, there was nothing um, dangerous about Singapore. It's just the culture. Um, As Lee Kuan Yew once said, who, if you don't know who he was, he was the, the prime minister of the country or premier or whatever for many, 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 many years. And he just always said, not in his lifetime, it wasn't going to become normal. But it did eventually, even with him still alive. He wasn't in power anymore. But uh, the Chinese culture, I mean, he, he, he says it himself, it's their Chinese culture that kept it hidden, yeah. not... 
um, he himself, but it, the, the the culture he he viewed was why they they tried to keep the the gay community under wraps, not let it really sp- be as open and spread out. Well, here you are, Len, an indigenous American <laughs> living at the other end of the world. <laughs> well, not really the other end of the world, but very far from everything. Um, yeah, as a as a gay man in a relationship, living in Singapore, living in a lesbian uh, mountain village <laughs> community, it's amazing. Like I'm I'm fascinated by your life and um, by your stories. Like I really appreciate um, your time and and everything. Um, and also, I have I have a f- like maybe a few more questions, and then we, okay. we uh, call it. Um, but um, what I'm curious about because you've been to so many different schools. Um, and I'm I'm always very interested in the school system that we have um, in our world in different countries. Um, and do you um, have any and do you have an idea of how we could improve our school systems? Because I think the earlier we start with those things, the better we can grow as a society into something that's um, yeah probably better that we have nowadays. Well, I I think universally, the problem with schools everywhere in the world is preparing people to be decision makers. That's teaching people how to do maths and English is one thing, but teaching people to be make decisions and good decisions for their lives. Um, I, I uh, look at myself at age 70 and, and say, if I was going to talk to myself at 18, what would I say? I says, don't pass up any opportunity. Take it, or it, no one's no one's going to give it to you. You have to take it. I mean, I, I view that uh, no one's really given me anything in life, just handed me something outrageously special. Uh, you have to do it yourself. No one's ever going to do that for you, no matter where you come from, what kind of money you're behind you. If you don't just go take, take it, I mean – Politely, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking, you know, Russian and just take things, but I'm talking about take every opportunity you've got because um, getting to 70 comes really, really fast. It's been a lot of fun, mm-hmm. but it, it happens really, really fast. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, you, you already mentioned you're getting to your 70s, um, which – I wouldn't have <laughs> expected I wouldn't have thought um, there's a compliment so um, uh, but what I'm trying to say is um, and you already mentioned it before like you like trying to save some for retirement so what are your plans um, for the for the future do you want to travel again do you want to see something else live somewhere else or? oh probably not going to live anywhere else no more major geographicals um, but probably um, once I stop work get around a little bit see a little bit more of uh culture in the world probably go to europe again and uh, do a, a a big run around europe i've i've done that twice in my life already but at different times yeah I, I did it from a historical point of view i first time went to europe was in the middle 70s and it was a very different place from what it is today um a lot of the things that you go, we went to see then were historical dealing with World War II. Um, they had a lot of pride in either what they did to help in the war or, or how bad they were beat up in the war. It was that, that was Europe in the 70s. Um, nowadays, it's how prosperous they became and still keeping their history. So I have to go back and see that now. Mm-hmm. Wow. Cool. So we have we're nearly one hour in, um, and I'm um, I'm very considerate of your time, and also that you might want to go home, and um, you know after a long day at work, um, yeah, we are also using the facilities of um, the company, the organization we work for, Breckenridge, um, and also like just maybe one of the last questions now from my side. Um, what brought you into um, the disability sector and working for an organization like Breckenridge? Well. One of my early jobs was working for the disability sector in the U.S. This was back in 1980. Um, we had sheltered workshops that, han- that hired handicapped people. We had uh, uh, dormitories where we had like 75 young people living who all had some kind of a disability. And most of them were mental um, problems, uh, 
every diagnosis you could imagine. And I really enjoyed working for them. The problem was the industry, unfortunately, is a very low-paying sector. So I left because of that, because money was important back in those days um, and went into something else. Um, When I moved back to Christchurch, I I didn't come back into this industry till I moved to, no, well, to Auckland. About uh, 2012, I went to work for a company very similar to where I work now, where we provided services for disabilities and had, I think we had... um, 50, 60 houses where I was working. I enjoyed working there, dealing with the problems. The same problems there, the same problems here. So it's something I know very well. And um, usually in the disability sector, I think people have a heart. Whereas in a lot of businesses, they don't care about the employees. They just care about the making money. And here, I, I think in the disability sector, and every I've worked in three different companies. They all are concerned about the employees and and the clients they deal with. So the disability sector does have that. Um, it's low paying. It's still low paying nowadays, but it um, has a heart as far compared to most companies. Yeah. It's very rewarding, yeah. Um, Okay, let's um, come to an end. So uh, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Um, And I'm I'm a lucky one that I can have many more conversations with you. Um, So, But we've called it an end now. And um, yeah, so I say goodbye from my side. But if there's anything um, that you want to say, here's the time for it. Oh, well, it's it's been interesting to uh, do a little bit of a drawback and go back in life and uh, where I've been and uh, wow I've uh, gone a long way I, I there's some things that I hi- highlights that I that I didn't mention that were like cool places that I've lived or uh, I mean I, I used to live in a sugar mill on St. Croix you know that a hurricane would hit it every year <laughs> and the people of the Caribbean would always say we have short memories we're coming right back to the same place. I lived up on top of a volcano in Indonesia for a, a year, and every night, for 20, every 26 minutes, the volcano would erupt. It was like a cigarette. You know when you take a cigarette puff of a cigarette at night, you see it light up red? Well, that's what the top of the volcano used to do. And I always thought it was the coolest place to live, and you tell that to most people, and they say, weren't you afraid? I said, no. Like, like the people in Puerto Rico said, we have short memories. We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you.